Ow! Hey everyone, welcome to Res Dog Walkers Podcast. I'm your host, Dallas Smith. I'm here to talk about the benefits of First Nations, resource developers, and government working together in British Columbia and across Canada. When First Nations communities are healthy and have opportunities, we all benefit. This podcast has been launched alongside the BC Indigenous Resource Opportunities Conference, BC IROC, happening April 24th to 26th, 2024 in Nanaimo, BC. Save the date and visit our website at www.bciroc.ca to learn more. My guest today is Miles Richardson, youngest ever president of the Council of Haida Nation. He's been a dear friend of my father's, even though he's much younger than my father. Been a dear friend of mine, even though he's a little bit older than me. And it's just really an honor to have such a trailblazer on today's episode. How are you, Miles? Very well. We could go anywhere with this discussion. I'm thinking of your fishing boat up in Haida Gwaii that we keep talking about getting out and going to slay some fish. Um, you and I get to enjoy some rounds of golf together every once in a while when we have time, but maybe for the listeners' interest, why don't you just give us a little bit of an introduction about yourself, um, and you know, I know you were the youngest ever, and still the youngest ever, president of the Council of the Haida Nation, but why don't you give us a little introduction? I am, I am Kilsly Kaji Sting. I'm from the Eagles of Kailnagai. Joth of the Haida Nation, where I'm from the West Coast, and our people over the years have moved in between Skidigat Inlet, where the Haida Cultural Center is right now, Kailnagai. That's where our people came out of the ocean that, that in, as we came onto this earth. I've, I'm born a citizen of the Haida Nation, I've been very fortunate to have been, over the years, a political leader, as you say, for the Council of the Haida Nation, our nation's government, and I did that role from about 1983 to 1996 as as elected president, and you know, before then, I, I grew up in Ida Gwaii. I never left Ida Gwaii until grade 10. The only reason I left then is because we didn't have grade 11 and 12 in Skidigat, in, in, in do what's dodging Geats. So I, I went then for grade 11 and 12 over to Prince Rupert, where I lived with um, my grandmother, my nunai, my dad's mother, who... who lived in Prince Rupert, and I graduated from senior high in Prince Rupert in 73. After that, I went to UVic just because I wanted to go to university. Not many people in my generation were interested in university, but I just had some, you know, I knew my would make my parents happy, but I also wanted to see what it would accomplish, I, and I'm really happy I made that decision to, to go to university in Victoria, and I earned a bachelor's degree in economics. So when I came home, my intention, I, I had no political intentions. I wanted to be a business tycoon. That's kind of what, that's what I had in mind, and my own people had a different idea. I was... Um, encouraged and all the time I was going to university I was encouraged to get involved in Ida politics which I wasn't much interested in to read books about Aboriginal title and the land question and all that <clears throat> that was going on then leaders like Percy Gladstone and Percy Williams and Dempsey Collinson and Tom Green and of course very importantly my parents encouraged um, my my uh, edification in that area. So when I came home after university, it wasn't a, a hard transition. I resisted it for a couple of years as I started to pull my business um, together. But um, yeah, I... I was 27 years old when I was elected president of our nation. 
And we had, I mean, I remember those days. We, the small group of us who started in my age group, we we had to set up chairs for meetings to invite, encourage people to come. We had to make the coffee. You know, we started right from scratch. And it was, it was a, a labor of, of love, a labor of conviction. And our people, our people were the energy and the force behind the development of our nation right from day one. You know, when I first got involved in politics, our people, our people were so supportive, so involved in, in, you know, talking about strategy, talking about what we had to do to accomplish things. And when, when we said we had to march tomorrow, they were all there. It was a wonderful time. I thought it was always going to be like that. You know, we accomplished some things. It, it's it's been good. It's been it's been a good uh, a good road. So if, you know, if I was going to pare it down, Dallas. You know, when I when I look out, like right from the, this moment, but you know, I'm thinking back to when I first became that young president of the Ida Nation. When I looked at Canada, this this nation state of Canada, which was so influential and determinative of how are, how my the well-being of my people mm-hmm. when i looked out and at our islands and across this country i saw a mighty struggle going on and that struggle was between two forces one was the continuing fact the truth that we lived of our continuing nationhood like I know my people have since our creation Haida Gwaii's been our home. Mm. That's our place in this world. And we've developed over those hundreds of generations, over those thousands of years, a story and a relationship to place that is that is the equal, that is as clear and powerful as any on this earth. And we have responsibilities in that relationship to our place, which every generation of our nation has met before us. And we had no less that challenge. That truth was in a mighty struggle with this colonial Mm -hmm. fact. Canada, this nation state coming to our shores and telling us, a different story about who we are, telling us that we're these subjugated people, telling us that we're they let they legislated and 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 denied our story, denied who we are and our relationship to this place, and basically set us up as dependents to them under their authority. And, and they got away with it for you know almost a hundred years. They they but they did you know they they wiped out it, you know it's a common story on this coast. Mm-hmm. They wiped out ninety five percent of our people with disease oh, mm-hmm. before before moving in and asserting this. And it's a you know that old colonial story. It's an old story and it's true in many parts of the world, not just here. But that's the way I saw the world, this, in, this essentially, this struggle. And it's that struggle that I'm still fighting and that we're still fighting. And really, it's, a, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's an effort to be who we know we are. That's all. It's that simple. We're not asking anybody for anything. All we're asking them is to respect us as who we are, who we've always been. We got everything we need. You, you know, you brought up a couple couple of good points in that, in the citizenship side of that, to be a citizen of the Haida Nation. You know, watching the efforts that you guys have been a part of from Guayanas to Haida 1, Haida 2 title cases, to the recent announcements um, earlier this week around the recognition of title. Um, I don't think... Any of the governments of the previous days knew what they're doing when they decided to tangle with the Haidas. 
Um, and it's been awesome to sort of watch. And like I mentioned before, is the Hydras have helped blaze a path. And they haven't just made it the Hyda path. They've kind of left breadcrumbs that have showed other nations how to take that citizenship model and try to go forward. And it's really interesting to continue to follow in some of those footsteps. Um, you know, you, you said a citizen of the Hyda nation. You've been that for a long time. I think one of the coolest things I've ever seen the Hydas do was when you guys took Bill Reed's canoe um, down the, was it the Seine? The Seine. The Seine, and you guys issued yourselves your own passports. Like, how baller is that? That's just one of those comfortable with who we are, and we're going to tell the world who we are, and we're going to issue ourselves our own passports to travel internationally. Um, just what was some of those times like as the Haidas were sort of introducing themselves to the world and who they are and where they come from? That must have been a, an amazing time. When 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 we started down this asserting our title, asserting just standing up and being who we are, we decided that we needed to. We know what our story is. We know what Haida law is, and it's an oral tradition. That's a strict oral tra oral tradition, much like yours. Um, that is passed on through the generations, but the other peoples in Canada and BC don't know that story. So we thought we had to write it down. Mm -hmm. We had to write it down to establish this, this good relation. So we built a constitution. And in that constitution, we defined our citizenship. Who's a citizen of the Haida Nation? That's nobody else's business in the mm -hmm. world but ours. A citizen of the Haida Nation is not an Indian under the Indian Act. It's not an Aboriginal person as defined in the Canadian constitution. It's a citizen under Haida law who has who is born into this world a Haida citizen and carries not only rights but re more importantly responsibilities mm -hmm. for for that. So we based it all on our own law and we started articulating that and evolving that through our constitution. So very early, I remember we're sitting. <laughs> sitting in our office one time and some smart ass Canadian official basically oh our pe our people were being um protecting our some sacred sites and when they appeared before the court said you know we're on we're Canadian citizens under duress. Um, we've never signed a, an mm. agreement, a nation to nation agreement, where we're we're part of Canada or we're that was just a fact. And some smart ass official said said um, well that well renounce your citizenship and and thirteen of us did. Uh -huh. And so we needed, because that was just a reaction, and that was the reality. That was the truth. We'd yeah. never ceded anything. We never yeah. ceded anything or agreed to the terms we'd join with Canada. And so it evolved, and we ended up producing our own passports that were really what high quality mm -hmm. and they were very cool. So when Bill Reed took Luta to Paris, I was president of the Ida Nation. Mm -hmm. And I, I went on my passport. So I got on a flight in, at YVR here at you know, 9 o'clock at night, and they let me. I just showed them. I didn't make a big deal of it. I showed them my passport and with my boarding pass and everything, and they let me on the plane, of course. you know. So I get on, and I arrive at the Gaulle in Paris, and I go to the... the um, visitor um what do you call it the the line where they let you into the country okay, customs, and yeah. customs they look at this and oh what's this hide a nation i'm a citizen of the hide a nation so they take it in the back next thing you know i'm in a room with five angry men who are just Wow, the hell did you get in here? <laughs> you get out of here or you can't come into our country. You get on that plane right now and I'm sitting there, sir. I've I've 
I've got a ticket in one week to return back home. I'm going to be here for a week, so you'd better accept me. And anyway, it went on and on, and I ended up being out there for all day in this interrogation room in Charles de Gaulle oh, oh. Airport. Next thing, you know, late in the, just, just before evening, our host comes, who's um, the director of the Musée de la Homme. Mm -hmm. that, that's where Bill was having his show. That's where he was displaying Luta. Yeah. So they called the director and had him come out and talk sense to me. And the director just says, no, no, this is who these people are. You know, they're, they're our guests. We got to accommodate them. So they gave me, in diplomatic terms, oh. free passage. Diplomatic which, immunity. Nice. Which is a high, you know, it's a Definitely. pretty high yeah. level of recognition. Definitely. And I remember we were negotiating the Guayanas Agreement then. And when I got home, we had a negotiating session, and Mulroney was prime minister, and his minister of environment was Lucien Bouchard, the Quebec separatist. So we sat down, and he, he'd heard about this, and he says, Miles, how the heck did you guys get free passage? Those are our people, and they won't even give it to us. <laughs> oh, my God, that is funny in I, so I, many different I, ways. I got a hundred stories about that, Dallas, about those passports. And I used it to go to the Soviet Union. I went to the, um, in 1992, my chief, Gothlai, and I went to the Global Forum of Spiritual and Parliamentary Leaders. I went with a Haida passport. They didn't even question it. They stamped it, and that's all I had the time I was there. <laughs> oh, that's incredible. I would have loved to see the look on Lucien Bouchard's face when he's asking you that question. Um, over the years, we just got out of practice with making them, and, and you know, there was a, it's a... A big commitment and and I think we should well we'll sort it out we'll we'll um it's not it's not the top priority right now we had to make the point in those <laughs> days and the points made oh could you imagine this day after 9-11 and all that showing up at an oh, international man. terminal with different, a, a different setting there would have been a different set of angry French dudes yeah <laughs> you know this this is awesome um in you know, you've always just found a way to continue to support your citizenship uh, uh, of your homeland. I know you're, you're a president of the council for a number of years, at over a dozen years. Um, I know you've had a couple stints in the First Nations Leadership Council, both as, as a younger man, and then you went back for another round. Um, what, what have you seen over the years as someone who's still involved in the evolution that started to take place with some of our leadership groups? You don't have to hurt anybody. <laughs> no, I've, and and I've I've seen. A, I look at the world through the lens. I explained at the front mm -hmm. this struggle between our nationhood and the forces of colonialism. I think we we give in too easily, mm -hmm. especially at a province wide level, and much more so at a national level in Canada. We give in too easy to those forces of colonialism. You know, one thing I really respect and, and cherish about my own people is, is, and everybody knows who they are the same as we do. You know, yeah. you know, you know who you are. You know what your responsibilities are. We got to stand up and be that. And it takes courage. It takes organizing. Mm -hmm. It takes effort. But that's what we got to do. You know, you're so right. I think that's something, you know, I've always... Jealous is not the right word because jealous sounds a negative, but I've always been envious and hopeful that the citizenship that you talk about in Haida Gwaii, you know, you talk to anyone from Haida Gwaii, whether it's a nanai or a younger generation kid or someone somewhere in the middle, they always seem to know what's going on. And we seem to need a bit more of that in some of our communities. Our communities have kind of lost focus on what some of us are doing. And I think that's why the leadership the leadership hasn't gotten weak by any means, but I think it's lost some of that authority that comes to it from the citizenship. And that's, when we're talking nationhood, that's the only place it can come from. You know, your responsibility to place, your rights to territory and place 
come from the land through the people. Mm -hmm. And th that's necessarily so. And if you don't have that legitimate mandate through the people, you don't have it. Yeah. That's not a negotiating point. That's just reality. That's just reality. If you don't have that foundation of the community, yeah. you know, you're so right. Um, and if you have it, I mean, our, our, our example is not perfect. But there's five thousand. evolving and growing. But as there's five thousand right? of us, Dallas. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then when when we're, our story is so clear and so right and so undeniable. When we're focused and together, there's no stopping it. You know, it, it's it's been interesting. You know, I got to start my career. My father has been a hereditary chief of our nation since 1982. You know, you know my dad pretty well. Been to a lot of the same struggles and through some of the causes and. You know, all the years of building these provincial institutions, like the definitely. summit. Well, remember the BC Ag Council, the, first. all those things. Yeah. Your dad was there. Yeah, him and Bill Wilson. Bill yeah, Wilson, they, they were inseparable. Yeah, Sophie. And, yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And so it's the older generation. The older, and I try not to say that because so, Sophie well, Pierre reminds me, hey, well, man. They, they were all full bore when I came along. Totally. Yeah. And they were, I mean, they were a force to be reckoned yeah. with. I, I, I've seen so many powerful, impactful speeches that are actually grounded in the reality of citizenship from yeah. some of those people that we just talked about. Um, but, you know, I, I, I've got with, the pleasure. With, with just That's interesting you say that. You know, I got a call the other day about the Ida title, la, the mm -hmm. land title agreement, the Ida agreement with BC. Way, yeah. I got a call from Bill Wilson. Oh. And that's he, he talked just what you're saying. Focus on the citizenship piece. Yeah. No, and that's that's amazing how that kind of keeps coming back root. And, you know, as I've kind of drinking my milk and grown up and found my path politically and community leadership wise, I've got to work with the next generation of Heidel leaders. You know, I, I count Trevor Russ as a great friend of mine and um, Gogwis, um, Jason Alsop and it's been a real neat to watch Strong these guys leaders. who grew up under the tutelage of people like yourself and Mr. Crosby and some of the other great chiefs before them. And to continue the same discussion, a lot of times when a different generation of leadership takes over, they start meandering in a different direction. And I think that's one of the great classic examples of Haida Gwaii and its citizenship and its citizenry is that you're all still fighting for the same thing, no matter who's in the chair. The direction's always been the same, and it's been so great to see. Yeah, that's that's one of the the powers of of writing out our constitution mm -hmm. and then uh, in interpreting Haida values and Haida law in a in a dynamic in a contemporary dynamic sense. Because you know, as as every generation of leaders puts its vision forward. It's put before the people and it's tested in front of the people, and the people have a chance to dissect it or approve it or, or turn change it, down. it. Yeah. yeah, turn it down, whatever. And and it so it becomes theirs, and it's all based in in it. And the Constitution is a growing, evolving mm -hmm. thing, just like life is. Yeah. And so it's powerful, and and all these leaders respect that, and. Um, because if they don't, they ain't leaders. They ain't for leaders long. very long, are they? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's so true. Um, you know, we talked about the leadership council and some of the roles that you played, and um, I think, I mean, I'm trying to say this without sounding like it's too over the top, but I've watched a lot of the things you and the people you've been working with over the year. I tried to bring a canoe to Europe when we finished the Great Bear Rainforest. I built a canoe with. Um, Pat Bell, who was the Minister of Sustainable Resource Management, and we couldn't do the same because you guys did, and so we were going to do the Rhine. Um, Mike Deong was the Minister of Aboriginal Relations, so he wanted that kind of Amsterdam, kind of that part of the world thing. And so we built this beautiful canoe. We built it six feet too long to fit in a shipping container. Oh, no. <laughs> and so we couldn't ship it, and just the Pat got cabinet shuffled and things moved on, but... We did that because the Haidas did it, um, and that was something that we wanted to do, and we thought we needed to continue to pay homage to the leadership who had broken ground for us to be able to do things like that. But 
Um, I ran in 2017 provincially. Um, you know, I, I had the confidence to do that because you ran federally. Why don't, why don't you just talk, who talked you into that first? And um, what, what did you learn from that? That was a tough was situation. Paul was that for Paul Martin or was in, that for... In, in 2004, Paul Martin was the, the was prime minister candidate. And um, it was, yeah, it, it was his first, he won a minority government okay. then. And his BC team had talked to me and talked me into running. Of course, the natural thing for me to do would have been to run with Jack Layton and the NDP, who also approached me. But I wanted to deal with... Um, title recognition. I wanted, I didn't think that the courts were the best place to do that. I thought that we could manifest the political will in this country behind not only Ida title, all the title that the first indigenous nations, the first nations in BC was my experience mm -hmm. that we could generate with well-meaning leaders, principled leaders like Paul Martin, we could generate the will to do this. And, like Kelowna, of course, and, right? and I'd had really strong relations with Paul through o over the years. And, you know, past um, prime ministers like Joe Clark and Kim Campbell and all them, and they got it. They knew what we're talking about, and they knew the politics of why it wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. And so I thought... It, if I could step in there and be in their ear every day, pushing the party in a principled way, mm -hmm. and and I thought, we only live once. I got to give it a chance. Totally. And, you know, I had illusions of being in cabinet, oh, and hey. that's why I wanted to run for the government. I didn't want to run for the opposition. opposition. <laughs> Jim Fulton was one of my best friends, yeah. and whenever I went to Ottawa, I set up camp in his office he made room for me and i operated out of there i knew what that world was like and but i wanted to be in cabinet and that was my intention and you know 40 percent of the vote in skeena bulkley valley where i ran they they wanted suggested that i run in the lower mainland in a safe seat i said if i'm running for running federal for government i'm running at home period yeah. and you know they basically said you know that's a tough one the Liberals have only ever won that riding once. <laughs> I said, well, it's to, we're going to win due. it again. Nice. And, and I believed that. And I'll tell you, I worked. Well, you like, wouldn't have done it if you didn't believe it, though. Right? I worked like crazy and, and um, had so many good people supporting. And it's, it's politics is a tough business. And, I'll, you know, I, I've. Up until then, I hadn't lost. I hadn't lost any Haida no, elections. Yeah. I wasn't. That, that kind of wasn't what I did. <laughs> that was a tough one. I'll tell you. It was. You're so far out there. You're. You're. You know. I. I remember public meetings and you know, in all the. Um, Non-indigenous towns up the Skeena and you know Smithers Terrace. Houston, little little towns like that, and the high feelings and the tough entangles with you know mm -hmm. with the Christian Libertarian Party candidates and the the Tories and you know the NDP pounding away with their message and it was a tangle. It was a you know it, it, it was a fight. But I wouldn't change it for anything. I loved it. And, yeah. and just um, the, the people I met and the people that, that supported it, it was an amazing experience. But I thought I was going to win. Didn't, but it was a good experience. No, it's a learning experience. And I mean. And then I watched, um, you know, what I watched Jody Wilson Rabel. Damn right. A few years later, she ran and she won. And she went into cabinet. That's what I had envisioned and doing. She changed Canada. And she took it as far. She did amazing. But I'll tell you, she lasted longer in cabinet than I think I would have. You know, she. <laughs> but she, she, she did an amazing job. And you're right. She changed this country. Yeah. In I think it was t 
Valentine's Day 2017 or 2018 when the Prime Minister stood up and announced Canada was adopting a nation-to-nation -nation relationship policy. That was Jody buying that, and that was a transformative moment yeah. for this country. Just, just articulating that that was the proper relationship. When I talk about the, the struggle and the scenario and how I look at the mm -hmm. challenge in front of us, that's exactly it. Nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Yeah. All we want to be is who we are. Mm -hmm. It's not that complicated. Yeah. No, and I mean, it's it's interesting. I don't want to say the floodgate, but it's awesome because, you know, you started down a path. I mean, I guess Frank Calder was probably the first of us to, to really get through and and to start that. But then Ellis went in 2017. Him and I were in the same, same campaign class yeah. and did a lot of that work. Melanie Mark. Um, Adam Olson, um, and so it's been great. I think you're so right that we just need to get our people involved in these in these parties so they can actually give them better advice on how to achieve that nationhood and that relationship that we're talking about achieving. Um, you know, you've, you've been around a long time over the years and met with a lot of different governments of different stripes. Who are some of the people that, you know, I hate the term gets it. Too many people told me, oh, he gets it. He gets it. I'm like, okay, we'll see. We'll see what that means. But who, who are some of the people that you've met throughout your career that, you know, understood where we needed to take this discussion? I mean, you talked about Joe Clark and Kim Campbell sort of understanding where it needed to go. But, you know, provincially for me, you know, Stan Hagen obviously was one of the first, but George Abbott was one of the first people actually sat down and got into an argument that never turned into something ugly it was we had a difference of opinion we talked it through and then we were both kind of on the same page with directions we needed to go who was someone like that through your years that you first thought okay i could work with people like this you know who i think brought about transformative change on the in the bc government on the non-indigenous side is your buddy stan hagen mm. um a big a big objective of of mine you know, we put in place the BC Treaty process. I, I still insist that the 19 recommendations and the principles we laid out are still the appropriate ones mm -hmm. for today. It's just that the federal and provincial governments, the Crown, Canada, did not live up to what they agreed to. Mm -hmm. That's why it never worked. So we adopted those principles and we set up the process and then we had to build each step, step by step. One of the key pieces to establishing the nation to nation relationship was doing land use. British Columbia had been big before the treaty process and leading into it on land use planning in this province. There was a war in the woods. Mm. Every cut block was being contested. Logging was the economy of British Columbia. We had to come up with a solution. That solution had to include First Nations. Mm -hmm. They set up land use planning processes that put First Nations at a lower level yeah. as stakeholders at that uh, stakeholders table. What we said, like Worsby Island, and yeah, what we said, and from the Haida Nation and others was. Look, you can have your stakeholder table and have everybody have a voice, but decisions have to be made at a government-to-government -government table that reflects this nation-to-nation -nation relationship. We pounded on BC. We tried Stephen Owen, Mike Harcourt, and tried everything to get that through. You know who ended up? The most unlikely duo ended up establishing all the North Coast land use planning tables which were established, they made a simple change. They had already had stakeholder tables that had forest industry, First Nations, species, everybody, everybody who had an interest at the table, but everything was authorized by the BC government. All we said, all you gotta do is put, us there. put First Nations at that equal decision-making table, government to government with BC. 
Stan Hagen brought it in the cabinet. He was Minister of Sustainability, and Premier Campbell adopted it. I give them big credit for that. They've done mm -hmm. some bad things in terms of First Nation relations. That was one of the most brilliant things that they did. And today, I mean, I, I've I known uh, mayors and, and civic officials on the North Coast who are pulling their hair out saying, we can't put indigenous people out of government at the same level as our provincial government. What are we doing? As things started, to, the economy started coming back, as cut permits started being issued, as, as, as um, things started getting normal, people, these same people were saying, why didn't we do this 100 years ago? <laughs> and, and, and I give Stan a lot of credit for that. He, he persuaded the premier, and the premier pushed it through cabinet. Now it's just the way we do no, business. We it's, a, it's, a building totally. block, yeah. it's a building block to nation to nation. I'm glad you brought it up that way. And, and you know another, you asked me about politicians who've made a difference. Another one I really believe is he just passed, Prime Minister Mulroney. Mm -hmm. He was an amazing leader. You know, he did some things like the GST and NAFTA. We were fighting him on it. He had a different view of these big projects and what was important, but he was a leader. He listened. He understood the importance of relationships and making change. Regionally. He'd come to Vancouver. He'd sit down with Bill Wilson and I, and he'd sit down like for an hour. This is the prime minister. And he'd just have a cup of coffee with us or whatever. And he'd um, say, tell me, why do you, why do you people, why can you make it in this society? What's, what's the difference? What, you know, he, he, anyway, he, in his own way, he was just trying to get to the bottom mm -hmm. of this issue. You know, when we were moving in on closing the Guayanas Agreement, it was BC Crown Land. Van der Zam was premier then. Mm -hmm. The only solution, we were, the Ida Nation wasn't interested in a park, yeah. but there was no um, legislative options in BC's menu of legislation. So the solution became clear to Mulroney that the federal government had to get this, uh, this Crown uh, jurisdiction from the province and do a nation-to-nation -nation agreement with the Ida. That was the only solution, so Mulroney did it. He spent $108 million, which seems like peanuts today, yeah. and BC turned that land over to Canada, and they amended their parks legislation to do a joint decision-making, mm -hmm. you know, an interim measure, essentially, with the Ida Nation, mm -hmm. and... Um, you know, the rest is history. It's lasted. It could have broke down any time over those years, but just the commitment, and I know many times it maybe should have, but the commitment of both sides has kept it going. Mm -hmm. Now what's going to happen, Dallas? It's just a matter of time. Haidas are going to be have legislative authority over that area. We're going to make laws over our own lands again. Mm -hmm. That was the opportunity that was... Um, the opportunity that we could do it cooperatively between the Haida Nation and Canada was something Mulroney helped bring in. Mm -hmm. I could go down the list. He was just a good, decent leader. He didn't agree. I didn't agree with all his objectives, or but most of his principles I could. So he made a difference. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's many of them. We could. We, well, I mean, Campbell, Gordon Campbell was an interesting one because he came in and fought the Nishka Treaty and was like the most hated man in First Nations communities. And then he left being called the chief of BC because of the reconciliation and recognition work that he started to lead and started to move that things around. And then we watched, you know, Christy Clark try to take it to a different level. Then John Horgan kind of tried to do some of his own piece. So it's been interesting seeing that we're making progress. You have to really step back far to be able to see the progress. Um, but it's interesting to see the progress from discussions that started in the 70s and 80s with Guayanas and some of those. Yeah, you got to see the progress. You got to understand the role of politics and all that. And how sometimes it gets in the way, sometimes it enables stuff. Mm -hmm. But you remember all those years that we had, um, what, 10 years of NDP government with uh, Harcourt and then. Uh, 
Glenn Clark. Glenn Clark and Bill and, Sands and Dan Miller. Yeah. Oh, yeah, all the whole, yeah, that was a long run. Yeah. NDP were in power in B.C. Campbell was waiting in the wings most of that time. In a couple of those elections, he was expected to win. Mm -hmm. He was getting gun shy. So he made a deal with the devil. He yeah. made a deal with the Reform Party. That would you know, to get him over the hump. Yeah. That if they joined him into into this election and take down the NDP, he would have a referendum. That was the deal. Yeah. Jack no Weisgerber yeah. was their leader. So they they won that election with that alliance with reform. Mm -hmm. He put Jack Weisgerber in with me at the Treaty Commission. That's I was right. chief commissioner That's then. Right. <laughs> and and went ahead with his referendum. And he did it, you know, he obviously did it because he wow. made that agreement. He did the same thing with the HSD. But, it, but as was, soon as yeah. the referendum was over, he apparently forgot it. Yeah. He went ahead and did some of the most progressive stuff on, on indigenous relations and building this. Because he understood the certainty. He doesn't know land certainty. Of That's, he understood sure. that BC needed it. So do you think, remember when Judas Ayers had that canoe, and I talked with Wade Grant about this last episode, when they put all those, the Neutrona put all their ballots from the from the referendum on the Nishka Treaty into a canoe, and then Judah shot that air flaming arrow into it. Do you think she practiced, or do you think that was just a one good shot that she made? I'm going to have to ask her about that. We'll have to get her on the next episode. And it was probably one good shot that, that the she winds made. were right and just had that Natana <laughs> breeze. She believed. Yeah, she believed. <laughs> but like you said, he just turned the page and decided to go. He had Jessica McDonald come in and start to just, you know, very abruptly shift how the civil service dealt with us. Because I noticed that change. We were always given platitudes, you know. I think the first deal I ever signed was with Glenn Clark and then Ujaldo Sanj, a bit of a bigger one. Um, but we never got to talk to deputy ministers much. And then when Gordon Campbell came in, he would make his deputy ministers work with us through yeah. Jessica McDonald and people. So it was interesting times. Those were really important steps. And, you know, I remember I, he showed up at the summit. I was just like, oh my God, who's here at the summit? Oh my God, yeah. it's Gordon Campbell. And, you know, I know our table, the Haida table, hadn't moved for years. Mm -hmm. And Campbell got in. He sent Jeff Plant to the table to to scuffle it out with, <laughs> Pre with Gouge? President Gujao <laughs> for a bit. And they figured out a way yeah, forward. Well, you know, and the next thing you oh, know. I'd love to have social media during those days when Gujao was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jeff Plant. Yeah. But... <laughs> and, and they did often. Yeah. And next thing, we have the Kunstiga protocol, the respect protocol, which is an interim measure, but it's a joint mm -hmm. decision-making over land yep. use issues that is, was the head of its time. Definitely. Years, you know, years, it's setting years. the table for transferring jurisdiction to the Haida Nation and BC vacating it. Mm -hmm. But it's Deputy minister to deputy minister, it's the officials' operating level yeah. that was brought in, and that was crucial. But, and I mean, it was totally, I mean, the, that was in 2010. Mm -hmm. Since then has been a learning curve on government-to-government -government relations, on how we get along in this area. That's, that's, that's what's enabling us to do what we're looking forward today, the title recognition. All those steps mm -hmm. were necessary. No, for sure. I mean, there, there's no kind of missteps. I think as Indigenous communities, we've kind of gotten better at learning as we go. We don't say something is a failure. It's something that just hasn't been achieved yet. Mm -hmm. We've learned how to recalibrate ourselves and go. But what are you doing now? I know you're doing some work with you, Vic. I know you're doing some work with the Indigenous Leadership Initiative, which I'm doing some work with in a different room, and we kind of cross paths every once in a while still. But what's keeping you busy on a day-to-day -day basis now? Well, the Indigenous Leadership the initiative has been a, a project I've been working on for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's basically taking 30-something um, years ago, the Haida Nation started the Haida Gwaii Watchmen, and that mm -hmm. was a transformative decision of getting out and... I've still got it, a sweater from, like, 88 it, when it was... Yeah, yeah, instead of keeping people away from our islands and making them not welcome, yeah. we welcomed them, and but tell them the and rules. educate them and educated them and told them the history and our stories and people loved it and it was a really strong step to build relations. So 10 years ago or so, there was a group across this country of indigenous people, about mm -hmm. 30 nations, the Innu on the East Coast, you know, who were fighting low level flying, the, um, the uh, 
Dene up in the Northwest Territories, some of the Inuit over water issues. Um, some of the there was about 30 there. groups who, who said, hey, why don't we learn from each other? Why don't we make, why, why don't we approach Canada and say, Canada, you talk about sustainability, you talk about wanting to be here forever, you're not living like that now, but maybe if we can lear- build something like a National Guardians Network mm. and learn to learn from each other and work together, maybe we could work on sustainability issues. So we persuaded the government of Canada to invest in that, and mm. since then they've done unprecedented investment with IPCAs, Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas, Guardians Network, and, and, and you know, we're up to 150, and who knows, we're going to be maxed out at probably 300 programs. I mean, there's 80 nations in this country, and some are still doing, you know, split up doing their own thing. It'll come together mm-hmm. organically, but it's coming along really well. I'm so... What, in relation to that, one thing I'm working on now is Canada, under the no- North American Free Trade Agreement, has set up, they have an environment committee. Another Mulroney accomplishment. Another Mulroney accomplishment, the, an environment committee with um, Mexico and the USA, and they have an Indigenous Standing Committee. Oh. So ILI in Canada sent me there a couple of years ago to to seed the idea of um, building guardians, indigenous-led protection and guardians initiatives in the U.S. and Mexico. The chair of this environment committee is a Mexican, and we just met in Victoria last November. They're they're all over it. They want to build in Mexico the National Guardians Network. The United States is already in totally, and I'm heading to Minneapolis in a week or so to um, share our experience on building a National Guardians Network with the U.S. tribes. Biden has already set the objective and financed it through the 30 by 30 initiative. Mm-hmm. They're going to preserve, they're going to protect 30% of the U.S. land base by 2030, and they're putting their 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 investment in First Nation-led conservation. It's a beautiful, and it's all started here, Dallas. Totally. It all started and so in it's, Nelson, it's, it's, we can do these things. It, it can, and it, it's interesting going with that option. As you know, I got to play a role in the 30 by 30 announcement with the Indigenous Leadership Initiative and the PFPs that were announced, yeah. the 800 million, and working with people like Val Courtois and some of these just amazing young leaders That's who are just taking you, you, all Canada's investment I was talking about, you built on top of that. <laughs> and that's it, just an example of what can happen. That's a beautiful example. Well, and because of the citizenship, we've got the mandate from our citizens to kind of we keep doing this work. And so it's really cool to have that reach out from other groups. I know we're heading down. And I know what's in your mind. Not only we're going to do protection, which our people need, mm-hmm. we got to have a balance, but you're going to build an economy based on those investments. Yep. That's that's every bit as important. A sustainable economy. A sustainable yeah. economy, exactly. Definitely. Is, no, you're going to dream. Dream big, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the other thing that I'm doing, you asked me the question, is at UVic, I'm chair and director of the National Consortium for Indigenous Economic Development, where we work in a triangle with First Nation governments, other governments, read federal, provincial, municipal, but really importantly, an industry business on supporting indigenous, the development of indigenous economies right across this country. I remember when we kicked it off in at UVic, Chief Andy Thomas from Esquimalt was one of our big supporters, and he was at our opening, and that was his speech. He said, Miles, as you move this initiative across this country, I want you to remember one thing. All we want to be is who we are. <laughs> That's our mantra. Oh, I miss I miss you, Thomas, sometimes just because of that common sense, but just clear, direct nature of how he delivers his message. Couldn't be any clearer. Um, so I've got a kind of a bit of a fun question for you. I mean, I don't get to get up to Haida Gwaii as much as I like to anymore, but I'm heading up in the fall. I'm heading up in September. 
Who am I more likely to catch a fish with, you or Chief Russ Jones? Well, you'll certainly catch all you want with me. <laughs> but, you know, Russ has been fishing all his life, and, and Russ is a... He can handle a reel. He he's a good fish. Russ is a really good fisherman. But I'd give him the inside track, because the last three or four years, I haven't been fishing that much, and he's... And he's been he's out there out regularly the, like, since, there he, every, since he retired. Every time he gets a spare day, he's out there. <laughs> I know it because he brings the fresh fish to my mom. Oh, there we go. There we go. That's always nice. <laughs> you, you know, you guys, guys like yourselves who kind of always had the opportunity to walk away, you know, I know you do some consulting and I know, you know, you keep doing what you're doing, but you keep getting drawn back to making tomorrow better for Indigenous communities. Is that just kind of what you're going to keep doing until the creator decides other ways? Or are you going to retire and go live on a beach somewhere? Or what, 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 what's your future looking like? Retire from what? True. <laughs> <laughs> One of my sisters said that to me the other day. For God's sake, bud, people your age are laying on a beach somewhere. Why are you still working? <laughs> Doesn't seem like work to me. I love it. It's it, it's. I, you know, I, it's important to me to have something to jump out of bed for in the morning and, you know, get, get going and doing important work. I, it's, and, you know, we see these, the evolution of the political relationship and all that is doing is setting the stage for building economies. That's, mm -hmm. that's really where my passions at that's Sustain, where you started that's where economy. you started you know when that you came my, out of university that was that's my what, motivation yeah. <laughs> that's what i wanted to so do you just took a long path to yeah. get to where you originally wanted to go in the early 80s but it was the only path yeah. you know and it was the it's the right path it is there's no that's a pretty lonely path to walk it alone to you know to be uh, just just part of a small group who um who found that path. Now we're, it's either all of us or none. Yeah, we're all That's... kind of meeting up there. We're not exactly. It's, it's, it's a nice time. Um, you know, obviously we say this every time we see each other, and I guess that's where I was going with the retirement side is, um, you know, I hope, I hope you get to play some more golf. I hope we get out on that fishing trip we've been talking about for a couple of years. But again, I just want to thank you. I mean, the leadership that you've shown from such a young age, I used to be and he had the same hair. It was darker, but you know, you just always had this glorious hair as I've gone down my path. I seem to keep scraping my head on the roof or something like that. But, um, you know, you, you, you've set, you've set a path that many of us younger leaders have got to learn from. And I just want you to know how much I appreciate it. And while we always connect on business from time to time, I really look forward to continuing the friendship we've developed. So thanks for coming. As do I. Thanks for inviting me in today, Dallas. I've really enjoyed it. All right. And good luck in all your and all the best in all your endeavors. I know there's many, many, and, many. They're, and they're all important. Thank all you. Right. Thanks, brother. Hawa. Hawa. Thank you so much, Miles, for being on the show today, and thank you, listeners, for tuning in. Don't miss out on the Eighth BC Indigenous Resource Opportunities Conference (BCI Rock) coming soon to Nanaimo, BC. April 24th to 26th, 2024. Since the beginning of the conference series, many successful partnerships now exist that bring significant benefits to First Nations, resource developers, businesses, and all levels of government. BCI Rock lays the foundation for future partnerships and benefits for First Nations and the resource sector. Visit our website at www.bcirock.ca to learn more. Oh, hey, oh, 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 oh.